If you want news and rumors that appeal, welcome to the dust. Hey, welcome back to the Dusty Wheel. I'm your host, The Innkeeper, and this is our live call and talk show all about the Wheel of Time. Welcome to the piano bar at the Dusty Wheel. That's right. Like I mentioned to you last week, uh, the Dusty Wheel is under construction. The new studio is happening. We actually have builders in our house working on it, well, at least prepping the room. And uh, so we're at Taylor's apartment. That's right. Uh, which we're calling now the piano bar at the Dusty Wheel. So, but you don't want to talk about that. You are spending your moment here, I guess, evenings, mornings, afternoons, depending on where you're at, to talk about the Wheel of Time animated origin stories. And to do that with me, I'm so, so excited to introduce my two wonderful guests, writer Ramy Park and director Dan DeFelice. Welcome to the Dusty Wheel, both of you. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having us, Matt. Ab Hello. Absolutely. Thank absolutely. You. Absolutely. Thank you for taking the time to out of your, I'm sure you're working today as I need to go back to work after this. So I appreciate you just taking some time with us to chat about origins, which honestly, hopefully you've heard this feedback from fans. If you haven't, uh, I hear it all the time. I feel this too, which is we've a lot of book fans just love, love, love seeing some of their cherished stories uh, from Robert Jordan's world brought to life in this way. And I, I want to dig into that a little bit. But before I do that, I think all the fans would, would murder me if I didn't ask this question. Because we all know the writer and director get to determine when this happens. <laughs> do you have any idea when, uh, when we'll see the episodes that Amazon mentioned will be coming here in August? Ramey? Um Well, Dan, you know, I think we both have that big green button from Amazon yeah. that says go publish. <laughs> go live, um, go live. <laughs> uh, all I can say about that I, is we're still in August and August was what was mentioned. So we'll hold to that. Okay. So yeah. that's uh, honestly, Wheel of Time fans are used to this, which is to say waiting for Wheel of Time content to come out, uh, especially new viewers now, right? They get to wait for a second season. And even it sounds like you're writing uh, a third season. So uh, there'll be lots of waiting to the fans out there watching. August has a couple more days. So it looks like Sorry. we'll be waiting for those. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's OK. Uh, in the end, uh, there are only at least seven more days. So uh, I know we'll end up seeing those soon. Now, I, I did want fans, I'm sure fans are kind of curious, uh, Ramey, for you, what was your introduction to The Wheel of Time? Have you been reading the books beforehand, or did, what, were you first introduced them as a writer? I uh, knew of the books um, beforehand, and I had read one of them because there was the sh a copy of The Shadow Rising was <laughs> okay. in an Airbnb that I was staying in, and it was just like on the bookshelf, and it popped out at me, and so I started reading it, and I was like, wait, this is... I'm kind of into this, although I was very confused because I was starting in the middle. <laughs> right, um, right, right. And then uh, once I started writing on the show, I went back and 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 you know read most of the series, which was which was a pretty incredible experience during COVID lockdown when I had a so, lot of time. 
Yeah, that's a that's a good time to jump into the wheel of time. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a funny origin story for yourself to jump into the Shadow Rising, which is uh, which is one of my favorites uh, of the book. So that's that's hilarious, Dan. For you, what was your introduction to the wheel of time? Uh, my introduction was a year and a half ago, actually, when uh, I got first approached about this project, directing the animation side. And so I'm I'm making my way through. I'm three and a half books in, plus uh, New Spring as well. So I've gone. I've everyone says to start New Spring after like book nine or book ten, but I I think for <laughs> for episode seven and Native Origins, I was I was like you know kind of keen to read a bit more about you know Land's backstory and everything. So yeah. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been a uh, it's been like a deep dive into like certain subject matters as well as kind of like trying to take in the whole series. But fourteen books is it's a lot so it's a lot away. it's a lot we try yeah. not to overwhelm people well you say 14 books but then you say like seven eight hundred pages each yeah and people get really overwhelmed pretty quickly yeah. uh when it comes to the origin stories and you said you got brought on a year and a half ago uh Ramey, when did you actually start writing uh for the origin stories um so i started writing uh the first season of origins after we had wrapped the writer's room for season two and okay. most of the cuts of the episodes for season one were like in a close to finished state. Um, so we had a good we had a good sense of sort of what that first season was going to look like. And that really helped define, you know, what these origins pieces were going to be and how they were kind of connected to each episode, at least thematically. Um, so that that was in 2020, the summer of 2020. Was that so was, was it originally intended then once you started that? Where did the idea then come from? Like, it sounds like you started writing these well after season one, had already been written. Who came up with the idea to do these? You know, I actually don't know. It, I don't know. it. it with Dan and um, some of the folks at Amazon, um, it kind of happened very organically where um, we knew that there was going to be sort of a big lull between seasons one and season two, and we wanted to continue to sort of keep the fan and fans engaged, and you know, take advantage of this amazing thing that Amazon is doing with X-ray, and um, just kind of started brainstorming internally about what an interesting way to do that might be. Um, and because the world of the Wheel of Time is so vast, and there are so many things that you know we were never going to be able to really dig into on screen. And also things that, you know, we wanted to explain, but maybe not might not be the most like dramatic scene, um, something like that, that that we started thinking, OK, well, what if we take and at the point, I think it was we knew it was going to be two to three minutes. So we knew it was short. Um, we kind of started brainstorming internally about, you know, what are cool ways to, you know, after somebody has seen episode one or two of the main show, what's a question that they might have that they might like to have answered either from a book fan or even from a new viewer. And so trying to come at it from that perspective and it just sort of developed organically, but it wasn't like somebody coming down and being like, this is what we're doing. You know, it was very yeah. much a discussion sort of internally. Well, and, and Dan, did you, I mean, it sounds like uh, this idea came out organically when you came in, was it already determined it was going to be this animated kind of, two to three minute ver like thing that you were going to be directing or were you part of kind of determining how the style that we are seeing on screen actually came about? Yeah. I mean, the, the first sort of, um, the first sort of like brief that I got was like moving paintings. And I think it was, I think it was Craig from Amazon and Mike from the main show as well. It was their sort of brainchild of like, you know, seeing concept work, seeing you know these um these subject matters that they just don't have time for in the main show kind of like marrying the two and so i came into you know uh scripts as well as just like some very very basic kind of concept art uh and it was like you know it was kind of a, like a make it happen sort of situation and so you know my my big prerogative was like you know what's the voice what's the sort of like how do we tell these stories what's the sort of animation style what is the um the look, the aesthetic, the sound, like how, like how, like how do we do this? Um, and so it was a, it was an evolution for, for sure, because, you know, um, kind of doing traditional cell animation wasn't really something I wanted to do. And I know, uh, like Craig and Mike we were pretty against like, you know, like CG heavy, um, kind of medium. So, you know, it was, it was really about like, how do we make it feel like a painting? And then the further we got, you know, my, my real thing that, that I wanted to feel was like connection to characters. So it wasn't just, voiceover from afar just explaining how Sadin and Sadar work but like 
like connecting to, you know, connecting to like a novice, connecting to an Aes Sedai, connecting to like an Ogier. And so, you know, um, I think a lot of the adaptation was like trying to like create, you know, humans and, and characters that you really connect to on a more narrative side while still trying to explain, you know, give a bit more backstory and a bit more like depth to, you know, what what's happening on the main series and kind of just, you know, explode out like an Ogier a little bit or explode out, you know, um, <laughs> right. you know, Minethrin or something like that. What do you think? I mean, I mean, digging into that a little bit is what do you think that animation can convey is it better uh, than live action? Like how is it better at giving information or why choose animation in this, in this way of conveying that information? Yeah. Uh, I mean, so the thing that I love about it is like the mythology side of things. It's like, there's this like great lore that kind of goes back. And I think some of my favorite things are the stories that like the main series is obviously like live action and we're like in that world. But a lot of these stories are like, like, um, like the greatest warder, for instance, like, and I saw a couple of fans had picked up on it, but like the idea was that with Jerome Guideen is that we, you know, it feels like a story that's been passed down. So it's got this like atmospheric kind of feel and it just feels more ethereal and metaphorical. And so I think a lot of the stories that are supplementary to the main series, um, animation just gives this ability to kind of be more poetic with it and kind of, you know, explore stories that maybe are, aren't so literal and they're more like oral told through, you know, told through like generations, told through, you know, um, like oral stories basically passed down. And so those are the stories that I think that are really interesting. And whereas the main series is much more like, it's very like pragmatic. It's like this person goes there and there's still obviously a lot more, there's still poetry to it because it's Robert Jordan's work. But I think the stories that are best suited for animation are supporting the main series in that way. Yeah, I think there's a definite kind of a Gleeman-esque. Exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think that's, at least for me, that's one of the things as a fan of the books I respond to. Like this is like two to three minute and I can kind of dive into this, this again, part of the history, uh, even the, the metaphysics, if you will, of yeah. the books and, and just get a, a nice chunk of a visually represented version of what I've been reading for the last uh, two and a half decades, uh, yeah. uh, three decades at this point. I can't remember. Uh, so no, that's, that's really, really, uh, really cool. And I know how much fans are excited again to kind of see what else you've been up to over these next, uh, sounds like next two episodes, if I remember correctly from San Diego comic-con, uh, again, if you're just joined us sometime in August is when those will drop. Uh, but for, for you, Ramey, on the other side, on the writing side, if fans aren't aware of this, you write for the main series. Uh, I think uh, Rafe said at San Diego Comic-Con, you guys were going to go write season three. So can you kind of speak to what the similarities and differences are of writing for the main series versus what you were trying to accomplish in writing for Origins? Mm, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I mean... I one of the big differences uh, is that I'm doing origins on my own. So there's less people to kind of bounce ideas around with. Um, but yeah. that's where someone like Sarah Nakamura is an absolute, I mean, she, like if I get her sign off then I'm like, okay, I did it. Success. Oh, sorry. My dog just joined. The <laughs> no way. Interview. Everyone loves, everyone loves uh, random <laughs> animals joining. It's, it's fun. It's fun. It's up. Um, but I think a big part of it too, there there is something nice about, you know, our core team kind of going over concepts together. You know, when I was brainstorming pitches for this, kind of the process that that we went through was, okay, here's every episode in the first season. And I would come up with a couple of related ideas that I thought could be done in two to three minutes um, and just kind of sussed out what Rafe thought, what Mike thought, what Craig thought, and kind of moved from there. Um, and it, it was very much, it was interesting that you mentioned the Gleeman earlier, because I wanted to find a way, as we were developing this, to have that kind of story time feeling. And there was a very, very early um, early pitch that didn't end up working out for various reasons, where I was like, is every episode like a song? Is it a Gleeman telling a story? And it's then yeah. explaining sort of what we're seeing. Um, or, and a couple of these survived, but is it always, you know, are you always in the POV of a novice at the White Tower and you're getting a lesson from the Brown Aja? Like there was yeah. a kind of, there's a structure that I think we were trying to create where we could um, kind of do a little bit of exposition and kind of talk about the things that are, you know, more difficult to, to dramatize for the main show, but kind of explain in a way to give a really good foundation and background um, for both new viewers and, and book readers as well. Yeah, I think that, I think that uh, it, cause it sounds like it's kind of, it's kind of ground up you 
coming to the team and saying, these are some of the ideas. Were there ideas that were coming down to you? Like we definitely have to have this one. Was it kind of a mix of that kind of collaboration or are you really driving the, the stories that we end up seeing in origins? Um, I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I hate to say that I'm driving all the stories in origins because really what's driving the stories is the main show, you know, um, sure, that's really where sure. the ideas are, are coming from. But I think, especially, I think, being both a newer reader as well as a writer for the show, I think I have a perspective of like what might be the question that is cool yeah. to answer in this short amount of time. You know, explaining the difference between Saidin and Saidar, for example, or even going through what all the different Ajas mean. Like we never really get to like hear about all of them in the show. We kind of meet them in different ways. And so just having three minutes where you learn about what the white Aja do, what the red, and just kind of, explaining and that way that's something that i as a as a newer reader would have like would have loved to have you know <laughs> just a yeah. kind of primer almost um and so that was kind of the perspective i was bringing to it as well something that would be both you know gratifying for people who were fans of the books but also helpful for people who are sort of just entering this world through the show yeah what's interesting is uh, it's the information as book readers we we know that information, right? We know the information we're hearing. Maybe we don't, not verbatim, we might not be able to quote it back to you, but it's, I think the the part for us, at least for me as a fan is the visual side is certainly the kind of, I, I get so engaged by the visual aspect of you giving us information that as, again, book fans, we, we know already. So I think that, that pairing has worked out really well as far as I've heard, as far as feedback about this. And, but it's that, it is that style the visual style that a lot of people, Dan, are very interested in. I mean, there's, uh, I would, they would kill me if I didn't ask a bunch of these kind of questions about that visual style. So, uh, yeah. you know, a lot of fans would call it distinct, beautiful, amazing. You know, uh, that's, I hear those words a lot. Is there a name for this style of animation that we're seeing? And uh, no. <laughs> what inspired that actual look and feel of it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess, first of all, it's like, I'm not a painter. So that's like, that's the first step is that there is a huge team of painters, animators, uh, you know, concept artists, uh, global too, you know, it's like, we've got team abroad. So I guess, shout out to everyone who worked, we had like 150 people on the project across all eight episodes. So thank you to everyone from production down. Um, huge, huge shout to you guys. Um, there is, I mean, I guess the best, I mean, it's, it's animation. Uh, there's definitely mixed medium as well. So we did a lot of as you would maybe call it like cell animation where it's like hand animated uh hand painted stuff like frame by frame on top there's cg under it that's painted over it's just kind of i mean uh i, I wouldn't want to it's a wheel of time but... origins look yeah it's just it's just, an or <laughs> it's, just it's just a mess it's the kitchen it's yeah. the kitchen sink it's the kitchen sink in a in a painted kind of way because it's just a it's a mess but in like a really beautiful kind of way um so yeah but the the approach was very much you know I would even go back to saying it was like about casting, casting the right painters. And then it's like how mm -hmm. to bring their work to life. The same that, you know, you would cast like an actor and kind of have them play a part. It's like, we've got the script and then, you know, you start going through painters and it's the thing that's tough too, is like people that are able to do iterative work and kind of work in a more VFX oriented way, but still be very artistic. And so it's, it was just a, it was really just a journey trying to find work that I felt connected to the scripts in a way that, um, you know, I wanted to portray, uh, but also like, you know, these painters that can kind of, you know, paint multiple backgrounds, paint characters, and just the sort of uh, really the painting process. And then you know, from a more visual effects perspective, I'm trying to keep it basic, but trying to like yeah. bring these characters to life, bring the environments to life. Um, and there's a lot of restrictions that we placed on ourselves to, in, in a in a good way to make it feel and look the way that it did and sound the way that it did too. Um, so I don't I don't know if that answers the question, but it was it was a it was a huge journey and a huge evolution because it wasn't like we like I came in in March and I was like this is what we're doing. It yep. like like any good art we it was like the tech is here. This is what we can do. We can try and do this. We got painters doing one thing, tech doing another, and you're trying to find this sort of unique way through. Um, so it wasn't like, I'm not like some godsend that was like, this is the technique and we're going to do it like ABC, yeah. like everyone get in line. It was like, all right, how, how are we going to do this? Because as the art unfolded, it's, it, it warranted a certain level of animation and style and everything. So it was a journey. It was a huge journey. 
were there specific? I mean, Ramey just mentioned, you know, uh, from a writing perspective, was maybe you know take this. It's a novice's journey through information. Yeah. Were there were there certain styles that you tried that just didn't work, and that's how you ended up? Like, can you speak to any of the things that just didn't work for you as you came yeah. together with this? I think anything that was overly uh, overly photographic. So anything that was like mm. too real. Uh, if the lighting felt like it was lit in a 3D scene and, you know, if you've got like a hard light kind of coming through a window, the shaft kind of hits perfectly, the shaft of light and kind of like, you know, I'm just doing my room, but it like rolls up my, the chair in my face and it's like the perfect, it's the perfect lighting setup and it feels, you know, beautifully photographic. That was wrong because when you paint, you know, it's never, it's never perfect. So it's all about imperfections and how how can we build in that sort of the randomness, the sort of the life, the the voice of the painter is trying to bring that to life. Um, yeah. So it always kind of came back to like, how can we make it feel like a painting, but also not like um, there's been a lot of, I won't call out any specific works, but there's been a lot of works that have like moving paintings. Uh, and so yeah. there was, it wasn't like trying to stay away from those because I didn't want to do that. But I just, I, I knew some, I knew there was something special that we were after. So I, I think we found it and, it's been an evolution even since uh, the first episode as well. So we're continually trying to push it and find new methods and everything while yeah. pushing story forward as at the end of the day. Yeah. And that's, uh, I guess that's always part of the iterative process. You know, yeah. uh, I'm imagining things changed from the first one you did. And as you yeah. continued forward, I can say this, I know how much fans have enjoyed the art and if Amazon, if you're listening out there, like, give us some of this art on stuff. Like people want t-shirts with some of the, like <laughs> people love this art. And uh, yeah. so like we need some products, just saying. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, I, I, Ramey, I, you get to dig into a part of the this that we love from a writing standpoint, which is the lore. How do you determine uh, the lore that you're going to include? And then whether or not you're going to pair it with the main series, because the main series, has adapted things, you know, changed certain plots, changed characters, changed even some metaphysics. So uh, how do you determine if you're going to stick with the lore from the books or not and how much you put in? Maybe speak to that process. Sure. Oh, yeah. oh do we lose? Uh, we lost Ramey there for a moment. Oh, lost, shoot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully Ramey will jump back out. I know she said uh, that she was uh, having some connection or it was, it was, it was a connection that she might be, might occur. So hopefully Ramey will be able to jump back on and be able to answer that question. And I know we only have you here for another five minutes, uh, five or 10 minutes or so. So until Ramey comes back, uh, Dan, just kind of uh, following up on some of the things that uh, we, I wanted to kind of curious about what were there any, things or topics i don't know how to say this uh were there any that just you decided not to do like you you made or you decided you were going to do the story and then you're like no this story isn't working from the lore of the books themselves that you can tell us about for season one nothing that was too like overt that we weren't going to do it'd be probably more about how do we approach a story i think you know um so for instance sometimes like the script would come through and is a little bit more it was just like a straight voiceover as opposed to maybe coming from someone that we would actually see on screen. Yeah. And so it was, you know, the, like the, the vessel, the eyes trying to give a protagonist to, I think all of the story, maybe except for breaking the first episode, which was yeah. just a little bit more, I mean, I guess even that had, you know, I said, I speaking to novices. Yeah, it did. Yeah. 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 So, you know, trying to always find a, a lens through which we can tell the story. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think early, especially early on in the process before we even had a style that we had all the scripts. So a lot of it was sort of, you know, taking the scripts, taking the essence of what it is and maybe like, okay, let's remove this. Let's maybe add this and trying to shape the scripts that like, once we had a style that was working pretty well, um, to try and like maybe adapt the scripts a little bit more to like, you know, fit the style and sort of go back and forth on them a little bit. So we never, we never like scrapped well we did scrap one thing but it's not a it's not a big deal um okay. just just in terms of uh it's just you know the as 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 things evolve uh you just kind of um and i mean ultimately seven and eight are kind of connected to the main are connected to the main series uh, but we're releasing them you know six months later so there was an evolution in the stories that we told in seven and eight and gotcha. kind of you know so what yeah. what what were some of the you know you look back at well, maybe I should ask you this. Did 
did we did you release them in the same order that you created them? So for example, no. was, was the okay? So the, which one was the first one you created? Can you, why don't you guess? Okay. Um, <laughs> of them, uh, if, if if you have an educated guess, it's it's not a big deal. Um, maybe the one on about Manetherin. Yeah. Was that the that first was one? Pr- Okay. That's the first one. Yeah. And, okay. and part of me wishes I could go back and redo it because we learned so much about characters uh, and how to do characters, you know, like more strong, like stronger and better and all that. But that was the first one because break, breaking had so much scope to it. Yeah. Um, but they're never it's never like you do one and then do the next year. They're always overlapping. And um, so that was that was the only out of order one that we did. I, um, I uh, okay. yes. So, yeah, well, I, I got a good guess there. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I was like, uh, <laughs> Uh, so very cool. Um, now, uh, what was I guess uh, the the change uh, the ch- all the changes as far as from the from Manetherin out to the final one you've done, and then you have two more. Uh, when we see these last two, are there things that kind of have changed about either style or the way you're telling the story in seven and eight that will be noticeable and that you're waiting you're, you're kind of anxious for us to see? Yeah, I mean the the main the main thing, which I I, I hope I'm allowed to say this. I, I don't think it's a big. It's it's more narrative as opposed to narrator. So okay. it's less of like a voiceover telling us, explaining things, and we're just a bit more into the story, which more character driven ultimately. There's still a bit of that form to it, still a bit of voiceover in both, uh, but they're more the more character driven. Okay. Yeah, no, that, I think that yeah. I think people will appreciate kind of knowing that, uh, again a little insight into yeah. what's happening there. I know I could probably have you for maybe one or two more questions here. Yeah. What can, can you speak to the technical process? You know, uh, that go that you go through from a directing standpoint when it comes to animated stories. Like I'm I'm uh, trying to imagine like what does this look like? You know, I'm trying I'm thinking traditional film and like okay, I imagine someone's behind a camera or they're getting they're getting like uh, uh, shots or clips and they're piecing them together, whatever it is. Can you speak to what this is like directing an animated origin story? Yeah, it's a nightmare. I mean, I I, uh, <laughs> I I have a lot of like live action experience, you know, filming, working with with actors and stuff. So yeah, that typical process is you know you do all the pre pro and then you shoot it and then you can just edit everything together. This is more you build up from you know the the ground the groundwork is like the storyboards. You know, it's um, so from very early on, it's like, you know, this shot to that shot to that shot. So you're really building up that story based on on the script. And then you're getting in a lot of like temp voice work. The temp voice work then drives like the timing of things. And then you start building in like very rough blocking CG pass. Um, and Remy's back. Oh, Remy's um, back. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's ve- you, do, you do a lot of passes. So it's like it's a yeah. lot of building up and layering up and slowly. Get, um, um, and then like TGW. Uh, the, sorry, the greatest warder. We did a uh, like a mocap shoot for some of those more fight-oriented sequences, um, and then you know the last two we we did a little bit more performance, not cap performance reference of um, you know of Daniel and yeah, uh, really and, cool. and all the actors. Yeah, so that like you know, that's more my wheelhouse. Where you've got you've got an actor, their face, and they're actually you know you're using that expression to like drive the CG, and you're using that expression to actually kind of um, help with like the pacing in terms of edit. So. Um, the, the, the old school animation thing is, uh, like all the credit to those, you know, those types of artists who do that. Cause it's, it's really, it's so time consuming and difficult to just like layer up in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, it, I like how you started it off. You're like, it's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could dig I mean, in even more. I wish I could dig, yeah. dig, I wish I could dig into the process even more. Uh, Ramey, yeah. uh, I know we're running out of time here. I'm going to ask you a really simple question because I'm sure the question I asked you, I, I will want to come back someday and get the answer to that question. But, um, uh, you mentioned at San Diego Comic Con that you know someone asked a question about season one, and, and you guys were kind of coy on the stage of like what you could say, and you said, "Well, let's just say we would like to maybe tackle Forsaken." You know, so I have to ask you, who is your favorite Forsaken? Ooh, ooh, okay, mm-hmm. it's a tie. It's a tie between two very different ones. <laughs> Okay. Um, I really love Lanfear. I think she's just, I mean, she's, she's really fun and there's a lot for her to do. Um, and I'm kind of obsessed with Mogedian. Okay. Okay. Mogedian's a good, uh, I mean, if you had to throw a second in, which I understand some people do. <laughs> but I understand I mean, some people gotta need... be number one. Gotta okay. be number one. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, clearly you've watched this show before or we're just on the same page because I agree. Lenfrey, <laughs> Lenfrey is the best. Uh, Dan, do you have a favorite Forsaken before we let you go? Um, I'm too early to tell. Just three and okay. a half books in. So I'll get back okay. to you when I'm, well, when I'm through. Get back to us. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, there's so many other questions I'm sure in chat. People are like, ask this, ask this. I know we, we have to let you go here. Thank you so much. Again, fans love this work and are looking forward to the next two episodes and hopefully more. Uh, that's Amazon. If you're out there, let this continue happening. I know how much uh, everyone has enjoyed it. Would love to see you guys continue this on f through future seasons. Uh, and please do. I hope you come back to the Dusty Wheel. But thank you very much for being here. Thank you for, for having, having us, Matt. And thank you for having my terrible internet. No, no worries. No worries. That happens. That's it's live. That's just, it just happens. Well, if you're, if you're out there watching, hopefully you've enjoyed this. Go check out Origins on Prime Video. It's you just look up the Wheel of Time on Amazon. They're there. They they pulled them out. They made them much more accessible than they were early on. If you have not checked them out and hopefully sometime in the next seven days, uh, we will see the last uh, or the next two episodes. Hopefully not the last. Okay, that's it, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us at the piano bar at the Dusty Wheel. <laughs> and thank you to Taylor for letting us use his apartment. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Taylor. <laughs> thank you, Taylor. <laughs> and as we say around here, good afternoon from the Dusty Wheel and smash to black. You went right to kill it. Look at you, you're all ready. You're just done. I mean, this is like, uh, this is one really of the well. biggest scenes. Um, and now I'm like, great, my turn. <laughs> you don't like that and um, you want to say, well, Robert Jordan could have made the two rivers all white. He could have, but he gotcha. didn't. So okay. I just complimented me so, on my dress, and as you can clearly see, I'm sad. I used to look at me as something along the lines of a Shida Haram analog. For the it does make sense why it outlasted the breaking. Yeah. <laughs> See, yeah. you know, this is why I have saying. Therese in the show because she's gonna correct everything that. Hey, everybody! I'm wrong welcome about to the Dusty Wheel Show. What? Me off challenge. Yay! Terrible, like baby face mounted on like a huge body. So like all <laughs> this of is not other. just <laughs> like, a traditional wow. fantasy, right? There, there are sci-fi. And elements just a moment ago, kind of uh, Rafe tweeted something. So let me get my guests in here with me, he and probably let's, I would let's say get, let's put in. Talking. 70, 80% of the work. I got to be over the shoulder and be like, no.